chapter of 1 John, chapter 1, 1 John chapter 1, we're in the very beginnings of a new series uh, in the letter of 1 John that we may know, and uh, every week we're going to be looking at different aspects of the Christian life, uh, things that we ought to know and not to leave it there because leaving it in our heads would do us no good unless we are actually practicing them and living them out. And so we're looking at different uh, truths that John brings out based on his context. And this week we're going to be looking at chapter 1, verses 5, all the way down to chapter 2, uh, verse 2. You know, in, in 1541, uh, John Calvin, one of the most influential Protestant reformers and quite possibly one of the most influential Christians of all time, uh, he wrote a massive treatise called The Institutes of the Christian Religion. And in this uh, book, it, it's, it's basically a systematic study of what the Christian life looks like. And he opens up his book by explaining that the Christian sort of lives on a, a two-sided coin. On, on the one hand, he says that we cannot know God without first knowing ourselves. He writes, uh, in recognizing our lowliness, ignorance, and vanity, as well as our perversity and corruption, we come to understand that true greatness, wisdom, truth, righteousness, and purity reside in God. Well, that's true enough. And he goes on to say, on the other side of the coin, we cannot truly understand ourselves rightly unless we understand and know God. He writes, conversely, we observe that no one ever attains clear knowledge of self unless he first gazes upon the face of the Lord and then turns back to look upon himself. That's fair enough as well. And however those two things work, uh, two things are certain. One, that we need to understand and see God rightly. And that comes not from some subjective uh, uh, extrapolation of what we want God to be like. Rather, it's all rooted in how God has revealed himself in his word. Second, we need to uh, understand ourselves rightly. And if we understood those two things, if we, if we understood God and we understood ourselves, then our lives, our situation, and the world that we live in would make a little more sense for you and I. And when John Calvin began his work in saying these things, he must have at some point have rooted this in our passage this morning. Last week we, we began our series in 1 John, and we learned that John is writing to the church of Ephesus, which is a hurting and divided church. They had recently suffered a, a large church split, and the split was due to some false teaching that came into their church. And had, it had a dramatic effect in both the lives and the faith of those uh, who remained within the church. And John now, as an exiled and, and essentially a persecuted pastor, he is trying to hold down the fort with the church that he had pastored before he was sent off to exile. And one of the first corrections that John had to make was to help his church return to a fundamental understanding of true Christian belief, which firstly is to uh, know the very nature of God, to understand the sinfulness of humanity, and to see Jesus Christ as our Redeemer. And now let's look at the passage together and see how Jesus, through John's pen, uh, will reveal himself to us this morning. So here we are in, in, the, in uh, the first John, starting in verse 5. This is what John writes under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. So this is the message that we heard from him and proclaimed to you, that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. If we say that we have fellowship with him. While we walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light, as he is in the light, 
We have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and his word is not in us. My little children, I'm writing these things to you so that you may not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. He is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. Let's pray. Father, um, we we ask, God, that you would reveal Christ to us in these moments. Would we see his glory? Would we see his goodness? Would we see him in light of who we are? We ask these things in Christ's name. Amen. Well, if we want to know God and, uh, and know Christ, there are a few things that, that John instructs us to do this morning. And the first one is that, that we ought to have a, a, a proper view of God's character. We ought to have a proper view of God's character. After initially laying out the gospel for us in verses 1 through 4, John lays out perhaps what is his, his central concern throughout this entire letter. And that is that he is concerned about the character of of God. Every encouragement that he brings, every correction that he makes is rooted in in a misunderstanding within the church of who God is. The message that he has for his readers comes not from from something of his imagination, but rather he is reflecting on something that Jesus Christ himself taught John. John when they spent time together, when Jesus was on this earth. And that message that he received from the Lord Jesus, he is now eager to proclaim to us who have a tendency to either forget certain characteristics about God or to ignore them completely or disbelieve them completely. And he summarizes the entire character of God and all of his complexities and all of those things that make him who he is. John summarizes him in one sentence. He says that God is light and in him there is no darkness at all. And so here, John, we see that he he describes the character of God in two ways. The first one is a positive and the second one is a negative. First, he talks about him positively. He, he says that God is light. Now, biblically speaking, uh, to say that God is light could have multiple meanings. When John says that God is light, he could be referring to God's glory. And indeed, that would be true, because when we look at any place in Scripture that anyone encounters the absolute glory of God, the light is so bright and it is so shining that they fall on their face thinking that they will die. When we look in in Acts and the Apostle Paul encounters the resurrected Jesus in all of his glory, what happens to Paul? The light is so so bright that Paul is literally blinded from the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ. So he could be referring to God as light in that. Or he could be referring to God being light as, as describing God's guidance throughout life and salvation. In Psalm 27, 1, David says of God, the Lord is my light and my salvation. There are many ways that we could talk about God being light, but in order to understand what John, what John is getting at here, we must look at the context by which he describes God as light. Look at the verses immediately following uh, verse 5, starting in verse 6. John writes, If we say that we have fellowship with him while we walk in darkness, we lie and don't practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. Now, notice the contrast here that, that John uses in both these verses that are clearly referring to how we conduct ourselves morally. Morally. 
either we are living in darkness, which means that we, are, we, we, we see that we're really living in patterns of sin that are, that are opposite of who God is, or we are living in light. We're walking in truth of, those, uh, of the light of God and, and, and who we are in reflecting God. Now, see the connections here uh, from verses 6 and 7 to the description of God in, in verse 5 as God being light. Uh, it must leave us with the understanding that John is making the emphatic uh, statement here that God is absolutely morally pure. That there is no trace of sin in God. There is no wrongdoing in God in anything He has done or anything that He would do or in any way that He thinks. There is no manipulation in God. There is no deceit in His character. He is totally perfect in every sense. And in case there is any confusion about what John is saying here, now he takes that positive and he rounds it off with a negative. John tells us that in God there is no darkness at all. Now for the sake of illustration, uh, imagine with me uh, the word that if God were a house, and just like any other house, uh, it's a house that's filled with rooms. And as you approach this house from the outside, you notice that the walls don't seem to be made of wood. They seem to be made of light. Totally bright. Everything about it is light. The door handle, uh, everything on the outside and the inside, you open up the, the, the door and you see that every single room you see is filled with absolute light light. And as you're walking through that house, you would assume that eventually you're going to see some room that, that has the lights off. You're going to open up a closet, or you're going to go down to the basement, or you're going to go underneath to the crawl space, and you're going to see somewhere in that house there's got to be darkness. But as you go through all of those things, the closets, the basements, and you look at every nook and cranny, you look at every crack that, that, that might be somewhere in the house, there is no instance anywhere of seeing anything but light. There is no shred of darkness, and that is how God is morally. You can search and search the depths of God's being, and you're not going to find anything that is morally impure. Everything that He does is in light of this character. And because he is morally pure and his actions, along with being the creator of everyone and everything, the character of God is the basis or the benchmark from which all goodness and moral purity come from. If we choose to disbelieve or ignore God's morally perfect character, then there is absolutely no standard by which we are conduct, to conduct ourselves. If God doesn't exist, or He is not who John says He is here, then we are left to ourselves to decide what is right and what is wrong. A couple of years ago, I made the decision to, uh, to stop having uh, debates on Facebook for obvious reasons um, because they're just not helpful. But before I did, I, I, I was engaged in a fascinating conversation with a relative who was trying to convert me to the idea that morality is nothing but a social construct and that what is right and wrong is ultimately determined by the governing authorities over that area. Uh, I, I understood where she was coming from because she was trying to help me see that the laws that the courts were uh, allowing in the United States of America were binding what is moral and what is right for American culture. And so, my response to that line of thinking was this. If it's true that morality is based on what the courts of a country would say is right and wrong, then by de facto, you are telling me that such things as, as female genital mutilation in African and Middle Eastern countries is moral because it's legal there. <laughs> 
you are telling me that the human atrocities against people in North, uh, uh, North Korea are completely moral and okay because it's sanctioned by the government. Further, you are telling me that German concentration camps in the 1930s and 40s were absolutely moral because the government sanctioned them. You're telling me that slavery in the early Americas and Jim Crow laws in the 1950s and 60s were completely acceptable because they were law. You can't logically backtrack and say that we know better now when you say that a government determines our morality. So you see, there must be an absolute standard by which we derive our morality from. And John is telling us that our morality is based on the perfect character of God. And when we disregard that perfect character of God, and all of us do in one way or another, we are prone to all sorts of messiness in our lives. All sorts of, of, of uh, complications in our society and in our churches. To misread, disregard, and forget the character of God is like pulling that crucial piece out of the Jenga game that when you pull it out, the whole tower comes crumbling down. So if we want to understand ourselves, and if we want to understand the world that, that we live in, we must firstly keep a proper understanding of God's perfect character. But that doesn't always happen. And so that leads us to the second point, is that we need to be honest about our sin and our sinfulness. You know, I don't, I don't get to do it so much anymore, but one of my uh, favorite things to do is to go to a symphony orchestra concert. And one of the most uh, interesting parts of a symphony orchestra concert for me happens just moments before the concert even begins. Uh, the, the members of the orchestra, they'll, they'll, they'll trickle into the stage, or if they're really disciplined, they'll all come out in, in some organized fashion. But after they come out, there is, there is absolute auditory chaos for about two minutes. Everybody, we have tubas that are tooting, we have flutes that are fluting, we have bassoons that are doing only the cool things that bassoons can do, and things are just, just wild and crazy until someone walks onto the stage. Usually it is a person with a, with a violin. Uh, if it's a symphony orchestra or if it's a wind ensemble, it's, it's usually a, a flautist, which that's what they're called. Uh, the person that is walking out with that is called the concert master. And when they arrive, they stand center stage and they play a note. And when they play that note, very quickly you will hear all the different sections of the orchestra playing with that note. Now, what is that concertmaster doing? That concertmaster is setting the pitch so that everybody is, uh, is getting on the same frequency. They're on the same frequency of sound by which the orchestra will perform their concert. And if just one of those instruments are off, it will affect the entire sound of the ensemble. God is our moral concertmaster. We must always be constantly tuning our moral frequencies in light of Him. But what happens when we don't? John turns our attention to, to two ways in which we're prone to do this, especially in our culture today, to be out of tune with God. And they all have to do with the idea of being realistic about our sin and being realistic about our sinfulness and our, our sinful condition and taking those things seriously. Notice first in verse 6. John tackles the problem of sinful hypocrisy. He says in verse 6, If we say that we have fellowship with him while walking in the darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. Now, it, it's striking to see how the heresies of the false teachings that, that hijack John's church have some unique connections to, to the church today in our contemporary climate. It's an argument that, that essentially says, all this talk about 
sin and, 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 and judgment. And, and Look, God is relatively unconcerned about how I live my life. It's not that big of a deal. In fact, God just wants me to be happy. And what I'm doing makes me happy, so therefore, God must be okay with it. That's the cultural view right now, but I, I, I fear that there is one more prevalent and perhaps more dangerous view that comes in the walls of the church. It's the one that comes with a smile and dress very well on Sunday morning and shakes a lot of hands and uh, says all the right things and goes through all the motions, but somewhere there's a disconnect between who they are here and who they are when they get home. There may be some of you here who come with those things, and yet you know what's going on at home. Maybe you are choosing to ignore it, but you can't escape the fact that you have a habit of bursting out in anger against your spouse. Maybe some of you ignore it, but you are guilty of physically abusing your children. Maybe you're, you're sly at technology, but you know that that pornography use is getting out of control. And yet, we come here and we sing great songs of the faith, we shake a few hands, and then go back to the hidden life. Look again in verse 6. If we say we have fellowship with him while we walk in darkness, we lie. We don't practice the truth. When our lives are lived in hypocrisy and believe that we have fellowship or, or partnership with God, John tells us that we are not only playing uh, according to the wrong frequency that the concert master has let out, we're not even playing the same song. We're lying to others in regards of what is true about us. So, if that's true of us, and in some way or another, all of us come here with a face of hypocrisy. Let's look at the remedy in verse 7. But if we walk in the light as He is in the light... We have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus cleanses us from all sin. Friends, when I look at what, what John is saying here, the remedy for hypocrisy is repentance. It is turning from it. It is acknowledging our sinfulness and turning from it and getting in concert pitch with God. It is to acknowledge the seriousness of our sin, but also to receive the only thing that can cleanse us from that sin, the substitution of Jesus on the cross as a punishment for those sins. We're out of tune and a second way in which we are is by denying sin. Look at verse 8. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. Now, verse 10 uh, is, is a little more nuanced. It's a little bit of a different argument, but for the sake of time, I'm going to lump them together here. Verse 10 says, If we say that we have not sinned, we make him, meaning God, a liar. And his word is not in us. In John's context, he is struggling against the argument that is saying, I don't need cleansing from my sin because I have no sin by which I need to be cleansed. There's nothing wrong with me. He is battling against ideas and actions which John and the Bible regard as sinful sinful. 
but it doesn't appear sinful to them. And once again, we see such a unique connection today because both the culture and sadly in the church, there's a tendency to see things backwards. We call what is good and right wicked, and we call things that are wrong and sinful good. And when we do, notice the progression of lies that John points out in our lives. Whereas verse 6, he says that we lie to others. Verse 8, John writes, we lie to ourselves. And in verse 10, we make God out to be the liar. So if we're going to be biblical people, we need not only see God's character right, but also need to see ourselves rightly. There is a such thing as sin. And it's not objectively defined. It's not what you think it is or what somebody else thinks it is. We are all infected by it, and the beginning of the way out now The hope that we see is laid out in verse 9, which tells us to confess it. Now, we can think that it's probably justified that confession can just be between us personally and God. But if we were to look at the whole of Scripture, it seems as if the confession that God has in mind is confession that is public in some way or another to a small group of people, large group, one or two, one person, whatever it is. In James 5.16, James says, confess your sins, not just to God, but to one another. And pray for one another that you may be healed. Now, uh, James here is probably not talking so much about physical healing, but rather spiritual healing, the healing that comes from confession. And when we confess, look at the results of verse 9. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So this confession, the result of the confession is really twofold. First, God is faithful and just to forgive us. Now this puts us into somewhat of a a logical um, confusion here because how can it be that God, if He's labeled here as just, if He is just, how can He let you and I off the hook? No judge, regardless of how good they are, would ever let anybody off the hook in this sort of way. Your Honor, I did it. I'm, I'm, I'm guilty. I'm completely guilty. So be it. And the judge says, okay, well, since you admitted it, you can go now. That would not be a good judge at all. So how is it that God could be just here? Uh, In order to see this, we need to look at what John says about God. Not only is he just, but he says that he is also what? Faithful. That God is faithful. And in this instance, uh, John is not saying that God is faithful to you and me, as true as that is. John is saying that God is faithful to his promises of forgiveness. And he is just in his faithfulness because in Christ Jesus, God's judicial sentence against us has been completely taken upon by Jesus Christ. And this is good news for those of us who want to excuse our sin or deny its seriousness. It shows how big of a deal sin is, but also how big of a God we have for taking it upon himself on our behalf. When I was in college, I was introduced to an opera singer that lived in the late 1800s and and, uh, mid-1900s named Florence Foster Jenkins. (laughs) 
Uh, now, there was just a, a movie that was done about her, and I, I've not seen the movie um, yet, but uh, Florence Foster Jenkins was a wealthy socialite uh, who was known particularly for her periodic booking of places like Carnegie Hall. And she would fill these places with all of her rich friends so that she could sing for them opera songs. The problem? She was a terrible singer. And, and I am not just uh, being nitpicky and picking out little things. Florence Foster Jenkins couldn't hit a note to save her life. Even just the first few notes of her CD called The Glory of the Human Voice <laughs> um, brings an immediate wince and embarrassment but the thing about Florence Foster Jenkins was, well, she thought she was amazing. She thought that she was a really good singer. But here's the thing. You and I are that same way as well. When we live life disregarding God's character and living as if morality is only subjectively defined. But when our lives are sung in the light of God's perfect pitch, our lives can be a beautiful symphony because we are playing in light of Christ's masterpiece in His work for us. So, we need to be honest about our sin and our sinful condition. But finally, we need to look to Christ, not as a hope, but as our only hope. Look to Christ as our only hope. In chapter 1, verses 6 through 10, John is making the argument that we need to be realistic about our sin and our sinful nature. Now when we get into chapter 2, John throws us a curveball and uh, we see it in, in, in chapter 2, verse 1. He says, My little children, which, uh, by the way, was a way that pastors in the early church would, would refer to the members of the church. I'm not going to call any of you my little children. I hope you're okay with that. But that's how John would, uh, or people in the early church, referred to the, their church members. I am, he says, My little children, I am writing these things to you so that you may not sin. Now, it would be really easy to look at this and say, what in the world is John talking about here? How can he say that he is writing so that we would not sin when he just told us that whoever says he has no sin is deceived and is lying? And in order to understand where John is getting at, we need to see John's pastoral heart. He is not saying that we need to work or achieve perfection. Rather, what he is saying is because of Christ's work on our behalf, because we are a new creation, we are no longer under the harsh slave master of sin. We now have the ability to choose to reject sin. And because of this, he is encouraging us to an, adopt an attitude that resists intentional sins. But, as a good pastor, John is realistic. And he understands that even as redeemed Christians, you and I, from time to time, will fall prey to uh, willful, intentional sins. And so he gave, gives us a great encouragement, one that if we were wise, we would read and memorize and preach to ourselves morning and evening. And it's at the verse, end of uh, verse 1 in chapter 2. Read along with me. It says, But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. He is the propitiation for our sins. 
and not only for ours, but also for the sins of the whole world. So in these two verses, he gives us strong support from the person and work of Jesus in, in two ways. First, as an advocate. On Easter Sunday, I'd mentioned that an advocate is someone who really goes to bat on behalf of someone else. And it's usually a person or, or a group that is, that is weaker and has no voice and has no strength. And here, John says that in our weak state one that is prone to temptation and failure, Jesus is pleading with the Father. But here's the rub, and I think the most exciting part of all of this, that while Jesus is pleading with the Father because of your sins, he is not pleading your case to him. If he was, there would be no hope. It would do him no good to say, Father, yes, this person did this, but look how good they are on the other stuff. Rather, in the throne room of God, Jesus is not pleading our case with him, but Jesus is pleading his case with the Father. On our behalf, he is essentially saying, Father, don't look at them for that, but rather look on me for my perfections. Look on me for my work on the cross. Remember that they are covered with my blood. He is pleading his case for you. <coughs> Excuse me. Second, he says that Jesus is a propitiation. That's a big word. Uh, in order to explain what propitiation is, we must see one aspect of what Jesus did on the cross in order to accomplish for us. The, uh, here the Bible affirms that God is gracious. He is slow to anger. He is abounding in steadfast love. He is truly all of those things. However, Scripture also affirms that God is truly just. And in order to be truly just, He must punish wrongdoing. And because of this, His wrath is on sinners. Now when we think of wrath, we ought not to think about it as some uncontrolled anger, but when it comes to God, his wrath is loosely defined as controlled sentencing for the cosmic crimes of sinners, of which everyone is guilty. But in Jesus Christ, God was made manifest. He was truly God and he was truly man. He lived a perfect life and in his death he took upon himself the wrath of God which we deserved. And in absorbing the wrath of God, Jesus became the propitiation for our sins. He took the wrath and we were exonerated. John writes the extent of this propitiation in verse 2. He is the propitiation not only for our sins, but for the sins of the whole world. Now, don't be confused here. John is not saying that Jesus' work on the cross exonerates everybody. This is not universalism. Not everybody is saved. There's only one way to receive this, which is God's grace through faith in Jesus Christ. Rather, what John is saying is that through uh, Christ's propitiation, it is so vast that if the entire world, all however many billions there are in the world, if they were all to turn to Christ right now, his work on the cross would be efficient for every single one of them. But practically speaking, this isn't how it plays out. 
because not everybody has saving faith. So we look at John's statement and we say that Jesus' work on the cross is efficient for, for, for uh, the whole world. Uh, it's, it's sufficient for everyone in the entire world, but it's only efficient for those who trust in him. You know, John Calvin was absolutely correct when he said that we live in a double-sided coin. We, we can't know God unless we know ourselves. But on the same token, we can't know ourselves unless we know God. But when we grasp both of those things, we understand the gospel. And based on everything that John has said to us so far, I'll leave you with a definition of the gospel and um, that was laid out by Tim Keller. And this is what he summarizes the gospel as. You're more sinful than you ever dared believe, but you're more loved than you ever dared hope. You are more sinful than you ever dared believe, but you're more loved than you ever dared hope. That's the message of 1 John 1, 5 through 2, 2. Let's pray together. Father, thank you so much for your great word to us. Father, this is a hard message. Uh, this is not easily received, and, and, and I'm not saying that because that's the culture we live in. This has never been an easy word for anyone to receive. But Father, I do ask, God, that your spirit would go forth from this, that it would bear much fruit and that it would grow. Father, I ask that if there are people here this morning that may not be taking sin seriously, that you would convict them of that, Father, and that you would lead them to the cross of Christ who will redeem them and cleanse them from all their sins. Father, I pray for those of us who... Uh, maybe have made um, the profession of faith in Jesus Christ, but our works and our lives and our thoughts, are, 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 they just don't line up. Father, would you help us to repent and turn to Christ and, have, uh, and, and continue to, to glory in the fact that your Son has absolved all of those sins from us. And so, Father, would you do that work in our hearts? And from here, would you help us to live lives that are pleasing to you, that are in step of who you are? May we know God rightly, and may we know ourselves well. And it's in Jesus' name that I ask this.